So um, I'm uh, Brian Cedillo. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And um, so I'll be talking about molecular networks of uh, plant secondary chemistry in uh, the genus Psychotria in Panama. So, uh, let's see, okay. so um, understanding the origins and maintenance of the tree diversity in tropical forests has challenged biologists for a generation. And yet there's an aspect of that diversity that often goes underappreciated, and that's that a, a small number of, of hyper-diverse tree genera contribute really a large portion of the species richness in a lot of the world's tropical forests. So those, those genera are particularly uh, challenging to understand, and that's partly because many closely related plant species often are similar in their traits. And so on the one hand, uh, as species filter into habitats based on their ability to tolerate local conditions, they end up living with species that are, that are phenotypically similar. And if those traits are conserved, then they end up living with close relatives. And yet, on the other hand, uh, species that share similar traits are expected to compete more intensively and perhaps to exclude one another from local communities. Um, and so I, I chose to investigate patterns of trade evolution and community structure in the genus Psychotria, uh, which is one uh, is an extremely diverse uh, genus of tropical trees. So Psychotria, as the name implies, is interesting chemically because um, it has psychotropic secondary compounds, the most famous of which is dimethyltryptamine, which, which is the uh, active ingredient in the hallucinogenic tea known as ayahuasca. Uh, so on Barra Colorado Island in Panama, there are 21 species of psychotria. And I was able to take advantage of a, a network of 134 plots that are three meters in radius that was set up by my collaborator Joe Wright in the early 90s. So to make a long story short, what we found is this, oops, oops, okay. what, we, what we found is this um, situation I've outlined in, in blue on the right. So physiological traits, particularly hydrological traits, are phylogenetically conserved in psychotria. And so as the psychotria filter into microhabitats based on their ability to tolerate drought, they end up living with their closest relatives on a scale of three meters on BCI. And so that's even more difficult to understand because not only do tropical forests have uh, really elevated numbers of tree species, and not only do, do a handful of, of really species-rich genera contribute a large proportion of the diversity in tropical forests, but within the species-rich genus, it's the closest relatives that live within three meters of each other and exploit the same phylogenetically conserved microhabitat preferences. Uh, and yet, there still lies hope in understanding how these species might co-occur and what might explain their diversity to begin with. And that lies in the body of theory that surrounds the Janssen McConnell hypothesis. And so, in essence, if species have specialized natural enemies, uh, and those enemies respond to the density of their host, either, either because they respond to the presence of an adult tree or the density of, of seedling carpets. Um, they often can preclude recruitment, prevent recruitment. Uh, anyway, beetles and plants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, this mechanism can create a rare species advantage and enhance recruitment among rare species and hinder recruitment among abundant species when and where they're abundant. So there's lots of evidence, both in temperate and tropical forests, that recruitment is uh, related to density of a species. And yet, on the other hand, there's lots of evidence that both insect herbivores and fungal pathogens, the agents thought responsible for this mechanism, are not specialized on single species. And if they're not specialized on single species, they may not be specialized enough for this mechanism to truly explain the diversity that is thought to maintain. Um, and yet, tropical forests are known to be these pharmacopias of chemical diversity. Uh, and, and so it, it would seem surprising to me if all that chemical variation was for naught. And so just to get that point across, I put up a, a painting that was painted by a Peruvian shaman who paints the visions that he has when he consumes ayahuasca. <laughs> so with that in mind, um, I was hiking around the forest on BCI uh, in Panama, and I'd see situations like this with two different species of psychotria are clearly getting eaten up by the same chrysomelic beetles. And yet in other situations, I would see that the species on the left it, whatever's devastating that species uh, clearly doesn't view the species on the right as a valid food source. And this is the same site photograph one year later. So these interactions have real consequences for community structure and for co-occurrence of the psychotria. So let's revisit our schematic here. We already know that the psychotria are phylogenetically clustered. They live within the same three meter radius plots as their closest relatives on the island. Well, what if we relax the assumption that the closest relatives are similar with respect to the chemical traits that determine the host use patterns of their natural enemies. Those same phylogenetically clustered communities might actually be over-dispersed with respect to the chemical traits 
that determine the host use of verb cores such that they might avoid sharing the same natural enemies, and that might facilitate their coexistence. So to test that hypothesis, I've gotten involved in a, um, a, a or taken advantage of a, a recent innovation in mass spectrometry called molecular networking that was developed by my collaborator Peter Dorstein at UC San Diego. So the way molecular networking works is you take these mass spectra, which represent uh, the, the fragments that a molecule breaks into when it's fragmented. And these can be thought of as, as molecular fingerprints of the structure of a compound. So when you compare these to one another, um, peaks that, that line up, that are shared by two spectra, indicate pieces that those two compounds shared in common, or structural similarities. So you compare the compounds to each other on a large scale, and you develop a similarity score that indicates sort of how many pieces they shared, and the extent to which similar. And you can use this information to build a network in which each node represents a unique compound, and the connectivity between them represents their structural similarity. So the advantage of doing this is you do this on a large scale, and it allows you to compare structural variation between compounds, even if you don't unambiguously know the structure of those compounds. So you can compare these to, to online repositories of, of, of spectra of, of compounds, but it also lets you compare the chemical constituency of species in a rainforest, most of which are, are unknown to science, at least the, the chemistry is unknown to science. So here is a molecular network of 21 species of Psychotria BCI. So again, each node represents a unique compound. So what I'm showing you here is how different, how chemically different two species of the same genus can be in a locality. So all the compounds found in Palicoria gynensis, which is actually a Psychotria, um, are in Cyan, and those in, in Psychotria marginata are in, are in Magenta. And you can see the ones that are dark green are compounds shared by these two species, and there are hardly any. Not only that, they're exploiting totally different regions of chemical space. And yet, at the genus level, there is phylogenetic signal. And it's pretty apparent when you look at this figure. So here I've colored all the compounds found in one of the two subgenera, magenta, and those found in the other subgenus, cyan. And in dark green, they're compounds that are shared between the two subgenera. And there are some compounds and some clusters of, of related compounds that are found in both subgenera. But for the most part, they're very chemically distinct. Um, here you can see the phylogeny. Uh, and so in this figure, I've plotted pairwise chemical similarity among species versus their phylogenetic relationships. And the black line indicates the genus-wide comparison, so there clearly is phylogenetic signal. And yet within each subgenus, that phylogenetic signal breaks down, so that distant relatives within a subgenus might actually be similar, and the closest relatives in a subgenus are chemically distinct. So here's an example. Having like a delayed reaction. Okay. So here's an example of five different closely related species from one subgenus. And you can see that they're exploiting, for the most part, vastly different areas of this chemical space. Uh, here is uh, an example. These are, are four close relatives from the other subgenus. And you can see that they, they seem to share the compounds in this chemical space here, but they're distinct in other places. Here's an example of two distantly related species from the same subgenus that shows that they've converged on this metabolic pathway or this cluster of related compounds here. Uh, okay, so let's, in light of those molecular networks, let's examine the community structure of the psychotria. The way to interpret this figure is every little gray dot represents one of the three meter radius plots on Barrow, Colorado Island. And any dot below the gray line is a, a plot in which the species that live there are more similar or more closely related than by chance. And any dot above the line is a, a plot in which the species that live there are more dissimilar or more distantly related than expected. So you can see that with respect to phylogeny, most plots have species that are closely related. And yet, they're less similar than expected by chance with respect to gross chemical similarity. So that seems to support our hypothesis that despite the fact that the species are phylogenetically clustered, chemical divergence allows them to be overdispersed, to, to differ in important ways chemically from their neighbors. And yet, what we haven't shown is that that chemistry has anything to do with determining the host range of herbivores. So to get at that aspect of this problem, um, I spent seven months uh, collecting herbivores on Barrow, Colorado Island, and DNA barcoded both the herbivores themselves and the plant DNA in their stomachs to produce a bipartite network of insect herbivores and the psychotria species they were found to have been feeding on. And so, if we look at the community structure, remember the psychotria live with their closest relatives, they're phylogenetically clustered, 
They're overdispersed with respect to chemistry, and they're even more overdispersed with respect to their insect herbivores. But you'll notice that there's a big discrepancy between the chemistry and the, and the herbivores. So what I think is going on there is here we're looking at, at gross chemistry. So perhaps some of the compounds, some of the, the, the chemical space we're looking at isn't actually relevant to determining your host ranges. Uh, and so if we, if, we would, if we knew which compounds mattered, the, the community pattern might look more like that of the herbivores. And so I spent a lot of time developing a hierarchical Bayesian model to model the probability that an herbivore eats a species of plant as a function of the traits of the plants. And I used these molecular networks to tell me which compounds are part of the same group. And I used these groups uh, in the hierarchical model so that, that the compounds weren't truly statistically independent. And so here's the result of that. So in this figure, the color indicates the, the, the strength of that compound in predicting herbivore host use patterns. So the compounds in red were strongly predictive of differences in host use patterns, and those in green were less so. So without describing it, I have a, a second Bayesian model that models uh, co-occurrence patterns among the psychotria in these plots using that same chemical framework. And here's the result of that model. So in this, in this uh, figure, <coughs> compounds in red are strongly associated with negative co-occurrence in plots among the psychotria, and those in yellow and uh, green are associated with positive co-occurrence. Um, and so if we compare the two models, uh, we're looking at here on the, on the x-axis, this is the, um, the strength, basically the, the, the strength with which a chemical trait predicts herbivore host use. And on the y-axis, it's whether that compound predicts positive or negative correlations in plots among the plant species. And so what this suggests is that the compounds that have a stronger effect on herbivore host use patterns are more associated with negative co-occurrence of the psychotric species in the plots. So when you, when you take this result against the background of the phylogenetic uh, conservation of, of hydraulic traits and habitat preferences, I think this is evidence of character displacement of anti-herbivore defenses in the community. Um, and so here's just a conclusion that contrasts these two patterns. So uh, I hope you have time for questions. Thank you. sampling at the endophyte community, both bacterial and, and fungal. And it's very interesting because there are some compounds that are probably produced by endophytes, um, but the, the endophyte host ranges are strongly associated with the chemical differences among the plants, just like the herbivores are. And, and in some cases, it's hard to tease apart whether the endophyte is making the compound or whether the endophyte stimulates the production of a compound in a plant, because that's also the case um, in, in cacao, at least, which is well studied. So oh, did you isolate the genes that produce these compounds from uh, isolate, is isolate the, the, the genes, the, 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 the gene or the gene is that? No, we haven't. And you, I think it would be really that would be really cool because then you can compare, then you can do phylogeny of the adult genes to see and compare your results with those. Yeah, so you look at these, I mean the question was whether I know the genetic basis of the, the compound variation among species. And I, I think it'd be so exciting to get a genome of a psychotria and, um, and do some comparative genomics to really understand what's going on. Because you look at that network and it's clear that, that some of those clusters of compounds represent metabolic pathways. And I think it's, it's really probable that there are some conserved metabolic pathways. And close relatives, or, or close relatives can, can vary by tweaking things along the end. And within some of the subgenera, distant relatives stumble upon some of the same compounds because they're really working with the same building blocks. It would be nice to understand that on, on a mechanistic level. Sorry. Um, uh, did the, I'm not sure how many of these insect species you, uh, you looked at in, in detail, but, um, but are they more specialized on average than Novotny et al. claim for the, basically for the New Guinea uh, fauna that they studied? And, uh, and, and furthermore, um, I'm blanking on the name of the group that was studying uh, uh, Central American the comparable Central American study. Didn't they find greater, greater host specialization? Um, I'm pretty familiar with some work by uh, Frodo Odegaard um, yeah. on beetles in Panama. Yeah, right, right. And they are more specialized than Novotny's New Guinea herbivores. But they're not single species specialists. 
So, um, and do, you think, of, do you think some of your beetles are? I, you know, it's hard to tell because uh, the, the apparent host specificity of an herbivore depends on the number of species sampled and the number of individuals of that beetle sampled. And so, uh, most of the herbivores I looked at weren't single species specialists, and those that appeared to be had small sample sizes. 